Good afternoon, Facebook Live. This is Robin Kirby Gade. Welcome to today. I pray that you are all having a good time in this part of the year, which brings great fellowships with friends and family. And so as you join in, be hopeful and expectant. God is just going to encourage you today. I just love encouragement. Who doesn't need encouragement, right? And so as you join on, be looking to be encouraged by the Holy Spirit and the Word of Truth. Amen. I see Kim Mitchell. God bless you. Thank you for joining in. And for all of you others that are joining in, God bless you all. Hey, Lisa Peterson. God bless you. Oh, thank you, Kim. It is super cold, so it is sweater time. Yay, Sue Gailey. Get ready to be encouraged. Hey, Stephanie. God bless. Thank you for joining in. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Yeah, turquoise is one of my favorite colors, especially being in Key West and seeing the water. The water is this color. I'm, I kid you not. It is beyond beautiful. Hey, Mary Chambers. God bless you. Thank you for joining in. Awesome to have you all on here. And as we get started, let us enter into this broadcast in prayer. God, we just thank you for the strength of your Holy Spirit and that, God, you pour wisdom out liberally from above as we are lifted up in our daily bread, knowing a strength that is immeasurable as you do the exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can think or imagine, according to the power of your Spirit inside of us in Jesus' name. Hey, Barbara Voigt, so good to see you. Oh my goodness, I have so missed teaching. I love teaching the Word. It is absolutely one of my most favorite things to do. And God wanted me to do a special broadcast today since we are upon Christmas and tomorrow's Christmas Eve and just bring in a special Christmas message to give hope. So we're going to be looking at the prophet Isaiah, and we're going to see the prophecy of Emmanuel, God with us. We're also going to see Isaiah 9 as well. Those are some of my favorite scriptures at this time of year, and it's adamantly made known in such a chaotic time. Now think about this, because we cannot measure things in the Bible against our time because we just don't have enough written about the things that were occurring in that era. But if we look at history and see things in a historical value of what was going on during the time of Jesus Christ, oh my goodness, it is absolutely mind-boggling. Because we never consider all the conspiracies, all the darkness, all that people had to endure in that era. But there was a lot. And this is the thing that cannot be emphasized enough, is that God is a God of hope. Amen, Kim. God's going to give you hope today, sister. And I tell people and have been telling them and I'm going to bring in Isaiah 8. I'm going to do Isaiah 7, Isaiah 8, and Isaiah 9. And that's going to be the Christmas message that God has me for this year S speak to you all. In other years, I've done the Luke, the gospel message from Luke about Jesus' birth. But God specifically wants me to do Isaiah 7, 8, and 9. Now, we're going to look at this in context and we're going to see in the error that the prophet Isaiah is also prophesying that he too is in the midst of chaos. And if we look at Isaiah 7, 8, and 9 in context, there is a foreshadowing of Christ. And I love the context that's going to be unpacked here because it's going to get your focus right, okay? And so, if you've got to have a theme for today's message, as we enter this time of celebrating Christ 
and we celebrate him every year. But there's something that I notice specifically in this time of year is that there's a slower pace. There are more opportunities to have days off of work. Schools are taking breaks and time is just slowing a baby hint for us to consider the joy of the Lord as our strength. One of the things that I purposefully do in this time of year is I become mindful of others and being able to be the light of Christ to other people. And as God provides windows of opportunity for me to shine that light into their darkness, it just blesses my soul and I feel absolutely rich. I feel so full and blessed. And that is the fulfillment of righteousness that we get to experience of what Christ did for us. If you look at Matthew 3 in the baptism of Jesus Christ, he went through a baptism not for repentance of sins because he didn't have any sin, right? He is without sin. And so Christ's baptism was to fulfill all righteousness. That's what Christ's baptism was. It was to fulfill. It was a fulfillment of righteousness. And as we have come into salvation, we get to partake of that righteousness and be in right standing to God the Father through Jesus Christ. Amen. And so I want to unpack Isaiah 7, 8, and 9. Not all the chapters, but just to let you know, I do unpack the entire chapter of Isaiah 7 in my new book, Mindfulness, the Mind of Christ, in chapter 6, which is actually the next group coaching session, session 21, and I'll be getting that out next week. And we're going to look at Isaiah 7 as it relates to verse 14. Hey, Sherry, I love you. So good to have you on here. We're going to look at Isaiah 7, 14, and we're going to look at then Isaiah 8, and Isaiah 9. And again, at the time of Jesus' birth, at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, at the time of the prophet Isaiah, even prophesying about Jesus and what is to come, there is just chaos, okay? And it is not just at that time we also see chaos in our time. But one thing I'm continually reminded of is that God is good and God is in absolute control over our lives, over all that's going on. And His promises are yes and amen. And His promises are sure. They're guaranteed. But do we conceive it do we conceive it or are we double-minded and so areas of your soul in which you have this double-mindedness as I mentioned briefly this morning on walking with wisdom there is this false narrative that you're either good or bad and that is because We've taken evil on to our own self-image. And likewise, we've taken God on to our own self-image in, in an unhealthy way. In a way that has deception and error. And so this message today is going to put your focus right to where you know that God is absolutely good. The enemy is bad. But guess what? Greater is Christ in you than he that is in the world. Greater is Christ in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Hold on. I'm getting scripture. I just want to get scripture. 1 John 4.4 4, We see that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. 
And remember, when we talk about the number four, I'm just bringing up the remembrance of that session 18 book coaching that I put up on my YouTube video and my YouTube channel. And that refers to the kingdom of heaven and harvest. So let's get into scripture and let's go into Isaiah 7. And we're going to look at verse 14. And we're going to get into the components of knowing Christ in us, the hope of glory. And in fact, before I even get into that, I do want to read 1 John 4.4. 4. And remember, 4 for us represents the harvest. And that harvest is righteousness, the fulfillment of righteousness. John 15.8 says that when we have good fruits of righteousness, that it glorifies the Father. Well, we learn in Romans 4 and in Romans 5 that Father Abraham had a struggle. And he had so much promise from the Lord that he continued to hope against hope. And no matter what, he didn't give up. And that hope was accounted unto him as righteousness because that hope was faith. One of the things that we see in Hebrews 11 is that faith is the evidence of things hoped for, things not seen. And so God wants me to just exhort you to keep hoping and to keep having faith. And I cannot emphasize that enough because of the power of God in you. God in you. And so the focus that's being made right in your body and mind, because remember, consecrate the body. What does that mean? It means that you're monitoring, you're aware of your emotions, and you're not going to give your members over to ungodly emotions. And when you have those ungodly emotions rising up in bad fruit, not that you're bad, but your fruit is bad. <laughs> because we either have good fruit representing God, or we either have bad fruit, and that represents Satan. And so today you're going to get that removal of good or bad out of your self-image. And you're going to see that you have fruit that might be bad that needs to be pruned. John 15, 2, that those that bear fruit, he prunes in order that they bear more excellent fruit. Amen. And what is that fruit? It is the righteousness of Christ. Christ in us, the hope of glory. So let's look at 1 John 4, 4. Scripture says, Little children, you are of God. You're of God. You belong to Him. And you have already defeated and overcome them, the agents of the Antichrist, because He who lives in you is greater than than he that is in the world. Now, let me read that again. And you know what? When I read this, understand that when I say he that is in you, point to your body, okay? This is the temple of Holy Spirit. This is where Holy Spirit is. And so we're looking at the body and its consecration, and we're acknowledging that Christ is in us. A lot of people have such double-mindedness because they don't keep the main thing the main thing, which is what? Christ in us, that we are the temple of Holy Spirit. Amen? So 1 John 4, 4, Scripture says, Little children, you are of God. You belong to Him and have already defeated and overcome them, the agents of the Antichrist, because he who lives in you is greater than he that is in the world. And so in order to perceive this identity of Christ in us and that we are hidden in Christ, it is no longer I that live, 
but it's Christ in me that lives. Hey, Liz Rodriguez. And so it's Christ in me that lives. Amen. And that is also in Scripture in Galatians 2.20. It is no longer I that live, but it's Christ in me that lives. And so let's look at Isaiah 7, and let's go to verse 14 and see the prophet's prophecy of Jesus, of Emmanuel. And let's look at the ancient Hebrew symbols of the olive bet in which this comes from. And let's look at this word picture because it's going to be more profound and bring more illumination of truth to you so that you know the omniscient God inside of you. Do you understand that we are to see miracles? We live in a dimension of such faith of a whole other universe is the way to look at it and analogize it to realize that we are not of this world. We're in it. But we're foreigners. We're pilgrims. We're just journeying through this world. And so we carry that righteousness of Christ that defeats and overcomes the obstacles of this universe, this world that we live in. We have the weapon, and that weapon is Christ. And that weapon is realized, it's actualized in us through love. Let me read this part of 1 John 4. Remember 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Well, also 1 John 4, 18 says that there is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. Now, let me say that with like a megaphone. I wish I had one that could reach to you, okay? And so, Scripture says there is no fear in love. There is no dread. Dread does not exist. It is non-existent. But full-grown, complete, perfect love turns fear out of the doors and it expels every trace of terror. For fear brings with it the thought of punishment. And so he who is afraid has not reached full maturity of love and is not yet grown into love's complete perfection. And so the litmus test in our Christian walk is the maturity of the love of Christ in us. Amen. And so that love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't judge people. It proclaims the ability of Holy Spirit to set people free by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. And so let's look at Isaiah 7 and let's go to verse 14 and get a comprehension of God with us. Christ in us. And that's the emphasis. That's how we get our focus right. It's not what is in the world, but it's who is in us. Jesus is greater. So let's look at verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Now, this is the prophet prophesying of Jesus' birth. Behold, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the young woman who is unmarried and a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. So let's look at this particular Hebrew word and let's get some context as we get ready to get into Isaiah 8 because it's the same thing. It has not changed just as the people of Israel came out of Egypt and only Caleb and Joshua had the God report. God is with us, okay? That's the holy report. It's pure. 
and the other ten spies, they had the evil report because they were in this world and the fear of Egypt had overtaken their soul and that fear remained. And so their report was evil and that report brought fear inside of the whole nation <clears throat> of Israel. You talk about a virus, the worst virus to your life emotionally is fear. And so the enemy will send people your way with messages that are messages of fear. And it will generally be about this present age and how big the giants are. Okay? And it's the same thing. Listen, God has repetitive messages through the word. And again, it's a chiastic structure, which is I'm going to tell you what I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you. And then I'm going to tell you what I just taught you. And it's also known as a redundant message spoken this way, that way, this way, that way. As it was with Israel overcoming the giants, that was a foreshadowing of Jesus totally defeating all the powers of this present age. In fact, let's look at John 16, and we're going to look at verse 33. John 16, and we're going to look at verse 33. You have to get this in you, God in us, God with us, amen? Verse 33 of John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you will have what? Tribulation and trials and distress and frustration. Now let me read that part again because this can't be emphasized enough. And where I'm going with Isaiah 7, 8, and 9 in context lines right up with what's going on across the globe in this present hour. But just like Joshua and Caleb, you know that God is with you to overcome everything that is in this world. And so that doesn't mean that as those that are in the world are going to be affected by what is going on, guess what? You don't have to be, okay? And so many people are double-minded and they don't trust God and so they just fall into the temptation of fear and they don't take God at His word and they're just cast to, to and forth by every wind of doctrine, as it says in Ephesians 4. And that is what the fivefold gifts of Jesus given to the church of what people call the fivefold ministers. They're to guard against the false doctrine that's put out there. And you're going to see in Isaiah 8 that largely the false doctrine is about conspiracy. And why is that? Because conspiracy brings fear and dread. It doesn't mean that things are not happening. Now hear this message. It doesn't mean that things aren't happening. And let me just bring this dream in that I had in 2019 and I no 2018. And I shared it again in 2019, and I shared it again in 2020. And so in 2018 of May, I had a dream that there was this big tower, and it had a spiral staircase, and there were different rooms going up the staircase, and it was like those old army hospital beds. And there were people asleep as I would walk up the staircase, 
and there were little gadgets under their bed that I described in great detail. It was a white saucer with a blue button on it, and I described it, and this was from 2018. And as I went up this tower, I just saw demons just going and attacking people. And the next thing I knew is that this entire tower blew up. And I was just so disturbed. And I was like, oh my goodness, God, what just happened? These people are all dead. And then all of a sudden, time went backwards. And it all started all over again. And I went up. And I went under the beds where these little devices were and began to take them and get them to where they could not detonate because I knew that in the dream they were some form of a bomb. And God said in the dream that he was going to redeem the time and allow things to go backwards so that people would not be hurt. The next year... I shared that dream again on my wall. I just hit share, and I had two gentlemen, one that worked with Spectrum and another one that worked at another office, and they said, Robin, the gadgets in your dream are in our office, and it's the new 5G dish net. And I looked it up, and sure enough, it was exactly the gadgets that were under the bed in my dream. And I realized that the tower represented the 5G tower. And then the next year came along, 2020, and I was telling people, look, just be alert. God is giving us a heads up. Something is coming, and we just need to be aware. And the next year came, and there was COVID. And, of course, I'm not going to get into all of this because I don't get into all that issue anymore. I know enough and I walk in wisdom, but I'm not going to spread a message of fear. Again, it doesn't mean that things are not happening, but my portion for me and my house is the portion of the Lord and the kingdom of heaven and the righteousness of Christ Jesus. And so... Things began to happen, and God unfolded my dream and had me warn and connect COVID with 5G, all of that. I'm not going to break it down. I'm not going to use that to do all this. But needless to say, he had me warn people. And as I look at the dream, and I see that God redeemed the time so that the bombs wouldn't blow up, I am firmly persuaded that that dream represents that I would speak a message of hope to the people to know that God is with us. Do not fear. Greater is he that is with us, in us, than he that is in the world. Now, this is not just about what's going on. It's also about your life personally. And people need to see the victory. And Liz has seen the victory in this. Amen, Liz? Especially with this issue. And so God is showing me that that dream represents that we are to be, oh my goodness, I feel the anointing on this, Liz. We are to be like Joshua and Caleb and keep our eyes that God is with us. We want the good report. We're not going to listen to the report of this present age or of conspiracies. We're going to listen to the report of the Lord. And I've had people that send me stuff about stuff that is in what I call the Nuki. And I, N-U-K-E-Y is the code word that I've given it for a reason. It's what goes inside, what some people are taking, okay? And I tell people that have taken it and they're in fear, I keep telling them, look, God is greater, okay? God is greater. I don't care what you're going through. If you know that your God is greater, then God will be greater for you. And so there are people that send me videos, constant videos, and I tell them, look, this is spreading a message of fear, It is spreading a message of fear. 
and they don't get it. And they say, no, I'm trying to wake people up. That's, that's exactly right. Ding, 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 ding. You're trying. You're trying. Can you not say that Holy Spirit is big enough to let people know that Holy Spirit can tell us what not to take into our temple? Is God not, is your God not big enough? Or do you think that you're bigger than God? That you have to inform everybody and it's all about you. Okay, enough of that. Healthy rant. Help me, Jesus. So let's look at scripture because again, that brings in fear and dread. And the reason that God's wrath was so large as it relates to Numbers 13 and the bad report being delivered to Israel because that bad report was at the cave of holiness. It was at the cave of holiness and they brought the standard of fear and they set the standard of fear in God's face. And they brought that standard of fear and infected an entire nation. Do you not realize... I keep telling y'all Isaiah 8, 11 through 15. I keep telling you, and I'm telling you, there are ministers, and Isaiah 8 says it. There are ministers that God, God is taking away. Not the devil. God is taking them away because they're bringing fear. They're bringing dread. And God will not tolerate ministers bringing dread and fear to his people, it profanes God's holiness. Oh my goodness, we'll get into that in a minute. So Isaiah 8, Isaiah 7, we're going to get to Isaiah. Now remember, 7, 8, and 9. Am, is, am I right? Does 7 become before 8? Does 8 come before 9? Does 8 come after 7? Does 9 come after 8? Would you agree that there is seven, eight, and nine. If you agree with me, say, yes, I agree. Am I right that seven, eight, and nine is, an, is order, okay? Seven comes before eight, eight comes before nine, nine comes after eight. So we're looking at Isaiah seven, God with us, thank you, Liz, God with us, then Isaiah eight, thank you, Dina, conspiracy, and then Isaiah 9, judgment. Isaiah 7, God with us. Isaiah 8, conspiracy. Isaiah 9, judgment. Amen, everybody. Thank y'all. And so let's look at Isaiah 7, 14 one more time. And we're going to look at the Hebrew word for Emmanuel and the Aleph Bet letters in the ancient pre-Canaanite symbols. And so verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold the young woman who is unmarried and a virgin. She shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. I know, Liz, is this not powerful? And again, Isaiah 7 will be the next book coaching session, session 21. And it's in chapter 6 of my new book, Mindfulness, The Mind of Christ, and it is the very most potent chapter in the book. Oh my goodness. And so the word Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us, it means God with us, and it comes from, it comes from the Hebrew word Im, which means with. And so let's look at the Olive Bet letters that are used in Emmanuel. They are Ayin, Mim, Noon, Vav, Wow, Alif, and Lamed. What? These are potent. Ayin, Mim, Noon, Vav, Alif, and Lamed. So let's look at these pre Canaanite symbols of the Alif bit letters and let's look at the word picture. This is potent. So, ayin, A-Y-N, is an ancient symbol of an eye. And it means to see, to know, to experience, 
And so you know it in your temple, in your body. It becomes a part of who you are. Mim is a three-humped looking M, but it's the ancient symbol of water, and it means massive, and it means to flood. In the positive, noon, N-U-N, is a fish swimming through water, and it means life and activity. Then we have Vav, V-A-V, a tent peg, a nail, and it means to add and secure. And then we have Aleph, A-L-E-P-H, the ancient symbol of an ox. It means strength, beginning, and first. And then we have Lamed, L-A-M-E-D. It's the ancient symbol of a cattle goat, which looks like a shepherd's staff with a prick in the curvature. And it means tongue, control, and authority. And so the word picture for the Olive Bet letters that I just gave you is seeing and experiencing the flooding of life. That activity that is added and secured by the strength that comes from the beginning and brings authority and control through your tongue. Oh my goodness. Listen to this word picture again. Seeing and experiencing the flooding forth of the activity of life that's added and secured to you from the beginning and that strength gives control and authority through your tongue i'm telling you you have what you speak and i'm not talking about just doing it out of your soul i am talking about doing it from the kingdom of heaven the place where we are from that other planet that other universe as an analogy where we bring yes liz john 10 10 life and life abundantly saints i'm telling you there is power so let's look at this we're either it's about the tongue right that there is what life and death are what in the power of the tongue oh my goodness that's proverbs 18 21 so let's look at proverbs 18 21 and i'm telling you that this is a message of life it's a message of faith amen and that's what god wants to bring he wants to bring a message of life a message of faith that's what joshua and caleb had amen and Joshua is a prototype, a foreshadowing of Christ. Caleb is a foreshadowing of those that are in relationship to Christ. Caleb actually means to yelp like a dog. What does that represent? Goliath says to David, why do you come at me like I am a dog? So the dog represents the enemy's voice, fear that is in your face, that by the tongue of God, the authority of truth in your members that you experience in your body as emotions, as holy, that that anointing of grace comes out and it turns the fear out. It scatters the enemy. And that dog is yelping. Woo! In Jesus' name. So let's look at Proverbs 18, 21. Scripture says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they who indulge in it shall eat the fruit thereof. Death or life. Now listen to that again. Death and life are in the tongue. And they that eat the fruit of it, indulge it, shall eat the fruit of it. So you have what you speak. If your message is fear, if you're spreading conspiracy, it doesn't matter if it's true. You're not to wake people up. Only Holy Spirit tells us what we need to be aware of. Otherwise, if we are spreading the message... 
and it's in our soul, it is going to bring the thoughts of fear of this present age. And it is going to make us afraid. And that is not what God wants us to do. So let's look at Isaiah 8. Isaiah 8, which comes after what? Isaiah 7. So we just did Isaiah 7, that there will be born of a virgin, a son, and he shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. That it doesn't matter what's happening in this world. What matters is who is inside of us. Christ has already overcome all the power of this world. Amen. Hey, Suzanne. So let's look at Isaiah 8 and let's start in verse 11. And let's, in fact, let's start in verse 10. Again, God is greater. God is greater. Christ is greater. God is with us. So let's look at Isaiah 8. Let's start in verse 10. And let's read up to verse 15. Take counsel together against Judah, but it shall come to naught. Well, in fact, let's start in verse 9. Make an uproar and be broken in pieces, O you peoples. Rage, raise the war cry. Do your worst and be utterly dismayed. Give ear. All of our enemies of far countries, gird yourselves for war and be thrown into consternation. Gird yourselves and be utterly dismayed. Take counsel together against Judah, but it shall come to naught. Whatever the enemy plans against you, it shall not prosper. No weapon formed against you, Isaiah 54, 17, shall prosper. And those who rise up in judgment against you, they shall fall into that snare. We can condemn that tongue because that is our inheritance as ones of righteousness, right standing with God. What does that mean? We've got authority of life in our tongue. And no matter what you say, guess what? My God is greater. God's bringing this to my remembrance where he wants me to share this for someone that's out there. So in 2003, God gave me, in 2002, God gave me a dream. And in the dream, I was lifted up in this waiting room in a hospital. And in this dream, I was sitting there. My youngest son was sitting there. And their dad was sitting in the same waiting room across some seats. And I was looking down. Okay, this is a year, 2002. All of a sudden, 2003 comes. And Holy Spirit told me to start fasting. I'm married to Rich. And we start a partial fast. And God said, you've got to fast and pray. And you got to go stand over Christopher, my oldest son at night. And you got to pray over him. And so, Rich and I did a partial fast for a week, and I would go stand over Chris and pray for him. He's in spring football training, has an injury, so to speak, and that injury leads him to the doctor. They say, oh, it's spring practice, that's what's wrong, but in my body, I knew it was something else, and then it kept getting worse. The pain kept growing to where Christopher couldn't walk. And I was standing over his bed at night and God said, pray. And the next thing I knew, and I kept telling doctors, I said, I know what you're saying, but it is not that. This is something else. And I know it. And the next thing I know is Christopher is admitted to the hospital. He goes to the emergency room. His health is declining. He's fighting for his life. He has massive temperature. He can't walk, and Rich has to carry him. I'm trying to do <laughs> The next thing I know, 
is my son is fighting for his life. And, and the doctors can, cannot figure out what is going on. So they're running tests. And I said, I don't care what you have to do. Administer antibiotics until you get an answer. Do something. And so it turns out that he had a staph infection that had gone into his bone. And it was all in his bones and it was taking over his body. And oh my goodness, it just alarmed me. And they said, we've got to take him into surgery. We have to give him a fighting chance. The infection is so bad that we have to drill into his bones and his legs. And we, ha we have to pull out that infection. And so the next thing I know is I am in this waiting room. I'm in this waiting room. And I am like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. This is the waiting room of my dream last year. Last year. The exact waiting room. The one that I was hovering over the waiting room. And me, my youngest son, and their dad, we were all sitting in the exact places in the dream that I had a year before. A year before. And God said to me, he said, Robin, everything is going to be okay. Believe in the God report. The God report. And I just had this peace flood me. And I started speaking life. And I refused for death to raise up. And I knew what God was going to do because he already gave me a heads up of the final outcome. And so then they had to do another surgery. They said, this is not enough. We have to give him a fighting chance. So we have to go in again and do another surgery and pull out more infection from the bones. And so they drilled into his bones again in his leg and they pulled out infection. And thanks be to God in Christ Jesus, once they did the IV to his heart, and began to administer antibiotics straight to his heart, and he had an IV pick, all of a sudden, oh my goodness, things turned around. And then we were in the hospital for two weeks, and then later on, he was discharged and had to be on home health for two and a half months with a pick line straight to his heart, to administer where we administered antibiotics throughout the day. And so this is what I found out. Are you ready? I found out that at that same time, other children just happened to have staph infection. Staph infection and that many did not make it. And this is what God told me. He said, Robin, that same spirit that went after the children at the time of Jesus and at the time of Moses was going after the children this hour. And I alerted you and averted the attack. And it did not come nigh your son. And I was just like, oh my goodness. Do you understand that what happens to others in this world does not have to be your report. It doesn't have to be your outcome. You don't have to be a part of the conspiracy that's occurring. And instead, you can be blessed. Amen, Liz. You can be blessed. You can be blessed. Do you get this, saints of God? So let's look at Isaiah 8, and let's go to verse 11. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me, and I had this dream, this exact dream of Isaiah 8, 11 through 15. I had this dream in the summer of 2015, this exact dream. Take count, uh, verse 11. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me, and 
warned and instructed me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy hard or holy all that this people will call conspiracy hard or holy neither be in fear of what they fear and let him god be your dread lest you offend him by your fear of man and distrust of him amen deborah and he shall be a sanctuary a sacred and indestructible asylum to those who reverently fear and trust in him but he shall be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel and a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble thereon and they shall fall and be broken and snared and taken. Now let me read these scriptures again and I want you to get what God is saying here through the prophet. He is saying, look, Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, will overcome all the power of this world. And you have to keep your focus right, and you can't let conspiracies of this present age influence you, bring dread and fear, and be a giant, and cause you to give an evil report, like the ten spies. You have to be like Joshua. You have to be like Caleb and not give in to the conspiracy and speak life in the midst of darkness, in the midst of chaos, agree with life. Just like I did with my son Christopher, I didn't agree with the evil report that was coming after my son with fear. God built my faith up where I was confident a thousand percent he was going to make it and he was going to live because my God had already told me the year before when he showed me where we would be. And saints, I'm telling you, God is speaking this message to you so that you're not caught up with those that in verse 15, it says that God will take them away. What does that mean? It means that they won't be on this earth. They'll be gone. And I'm telling you, I know that I know that many ministers are dying right now because they have majored on conspiracies and they are causing fear and dread and people to reverence conspiracy and to be in fear and they have profaned our God. Our God is a God who is holy. He is good. And He is not evil. Our God will be a sanctuary, a pavilion to us. Amen. So let me read verses 10 through 15 again. And then I'll finish with Isaiah 9. Amen, Liz. Liz knows this. Take counsel together. Well, verse 11. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned and instructed me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call a conspiracy hard or holy. All that this people shall call a conspiracy hard or holy. Neither be in fear of what they fear, nor make others afraid or in dread. Amen, Amy. I do it, sister. Amen, lady. The Lord of hosts... Regard him as holy and honor his holy name by regarding him as your only hope and safety. And let him be your fear and let him be your dread lest you offend him by your fear and distrust of him and your fear of man. And he shall be a sanctuary, a sacred indestructible asylum to those who reverently fear and trust in him but he shall be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel and a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and many among them shall stumble thereon and they shall be broken and snared and taken do you understand there is a real war but guess what 
You don't have to be in that war. God is Lord of the battle and you can choose to trust God. And if you choose to trust God, then although you're in the world, you're not of it. And he's your pavilion. He's your sanctuary. He's your peace. Like Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, where Jesus says, let me go to that scripture again and listen to the words of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, Deborah. I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you will have tribulation, you will have trials and distress and frustration, but be of good cheer. Be confident, take courage, be certain, be undaunted, for I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you, and I have conquered it for you. Woo! Hallelujah. Now watch this. Now we go to Isaiah 9. Isaiah 7, Isaiah 8, Isaiah 9. This is the context. And understand, this is Holy Spirit giving this message. And I know that this is such a message of light. I truly feel that it is going to set people free of strongholds of fear in this present age and conspiracies. And it doesn't have to touch our person because our focus is not on this world and its tribulations and its frustrations and its distress. Our focus is on Jesus and God with us. Emmanuel. Amen. So let's look at Isaiah 9 verse 1. Remember Isaiah 7, God with us. Isaiah 8, conspiracy. Stay away from it. Isaiah 9, judgment. What did I tell you? Ministers have died recently, big ministers, and I've been warning this for over a year. Isaiah 8, 11 through 15, God spoke to me specifically at the beginning of this year. Isaiah 8, 11 through 15, and I had the dream in 2015 of that exact scripture in detail. And you're going to see that many ministers are being taken because their message is one of fear. It's one of dread. And we're not to have any part of that. Amen. Isaiah 9. But in the midst of judgment, there is a promise and certainty of the Lord's deliverance. And there shall be no gloom for her who, who was in anguish. In the former time, the Lord brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time, when Christ comes, in the latter time, he will make it glorious. By the way of the Sea of Galilee, of the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of intense darkness and the shadow of death upon them has the light shined. You, O oh Lord, have multiplied the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you like the joy in harvest. Do you hear this? Our portion in the midst of this chaos, chaos is harvest. Let me read verse 3 again. You, O oh Lord, have multiplied the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you like the joy in harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil of battle. For the yoke of Israel's burden and the staff are rod for gold, goading their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor you have broken as in the days of Gideon with Midian. For every tramping war, warrior's war boots and his armor in the battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned up as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. 
of the increase of his government and of his peace, there shall be no end. On the, on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish and uphold it in justice and righteousness from the latter time forth forevermore, and the zeal of the Lord will perform it. What does this mean? It means that God becomes a sanctuary for his people. That you do not have to be caught up in the chaos of this present age. That God has brought the peace of Christ, God with us. And that our warfare of what is of this present age and what is going on with this present age. Y'all let me know if you can watch me, if you're seeing me, because it froze just one second. Just let me know. It means the warfare of this present age, guess what? Does not have to be our report. It doesn't have to be our life. Our report is to believe the report of life and life. Oh, good. Thanks, Suzanne. Of life and life abundantly. Do you hear this, saints of God? Our report is life. Thanks, Andrea. Is life abundantly. It doesn't have to be the report of this present age. And what is being cast out into the airways with news, with media, with voices speaking. Listen, God is our sanctuary. Christ has given us a peace that will have trials in this world, frustrations and distresses. But guess what? His peace surpasses all of our understanding. It rules our heart. And it causes us to abound in joy. <laughs> in joy. Amen. And so, saints, just look to Christ and know that He is God with us. In Jesus' name. So, I pray that the spirit of fear that is attached to your members... I pray that it be uprooted in the name of Jesus Christ like a mulberry tree, a mountain, and cast into the sea. And I take the word of truth and I speak John 8, 32, that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free of John 16, 33, that Jesus Christ has overcome all the power of this world and deprived it of its ability to harm you. And that you shall know, Isaiah seven fourteen, Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. Greater is he that is in us, 1 John 4, 4, than he that is in this world. And that you will know that God's decision is for you. His judgment is in your favor Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, and that you will not have to dwell in darkness, but that his light shines upon you, and that you arise from that place of prostration and depression in which circumstances have kept you of this present world. You arise, you shine, for your light is calm. Life has come. 1 John 4, 4. In him was life. And that life is the light of men. Your light has come. And the glory of God has risen upon you. In Jesus' name. And he shall bring nations to the brightness of your rising. In Jesus' name. Have an awesome, incredible time with friends and family. Bless them with that light that's inside of you and pour out life where it's needed. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Amen. I love you. And I will see you next week to return back to teaching. God bless you.